Welcome everyone to the Women in Standards October webinar. Today we're going to be talking about developing standards at IEC. I see a few of our members and maybe a few soon to be members. Thanks so much for joining us today. Feel free to use the chat throughout the presentation to, you know, bring up the topics that are interesting to you to ask questions to our presenter. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go into the Q&A and I'll be picking out your questions to ask. Um, so to get started, I'm going to continue to let people in as we go along, uh, but feel free to, to continue to use the chat. Thank you to the Women in Standards sponsors who support the organization's programs and events. Without your support, we would not be able to provide the level and caliber of education, content, and resources that we do. And thank you to our speakers today, speaker today, who donate, donates their time to help educate and inform on issues related to standards development. <laughs> Please note this panel will be recorded and the video shared online via the Women in Standards website. If you do not give your consent to be recorded, please log off now. A link to the recording will be provided a few days after the event, which will allow to, you time to view the panel discussion while respecting our wishes not to be, your wishes not to be recorded. Also, I kindly ask that you turn off your cameras and mute your phones throughout the presentation. Use the chat function to ask questions and to share your information. All questions can be posted and we'll be reviewing them after, at the end of the presentation. Today, we welcome Jans Henrik Tiedemann, head of the IEC Academy and Capacity Building at the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC. Today, Jan Hendrick will be providing an introduction to IEC, discuss the IEC standards development process, and provide insight into how IEC approaches international standards development. So welcome to Jan Hendrick, and I'll be turning over to him right now. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce IEC to all of you. And um, I will just take the remote control. Okay, I have it now. Okay, let me see. Very good. Perfect. So thank you very much, Karin. Um, I will start the presentation. Uh, you already introduced me. So my name is Jan Henrik Tiedemann. As you can hear by my accent, uh, I don't get rid of this anymore. I think I'm from Germany. Um, in my career, I've been working for DIN for the uh, National Standards Organization in Germany. I've been working for ISO for many years. And now, since, two, since 2011, I'm working for the IEC. Um, my function at the IEC is training, so um, building projects, some innovation projects, and I recently created a new uh, function within the IEC, a new department, and this is the IEC Academy. So we are training, and in this function, we've been around the world to train also uh, countries on standardization and courage people to participate because standardization is transparent, uh, shall be open. And in this function, I want to give you an introduction to standardization. I hope it's interesting and uh, feel, please feel free to ask any question about this. So thank you again and let's start. Um, standardization, of course, international standardization, uh, we are a part of this and you probably have seen these logos, so IEC, ISO, ITU, these are three international organizations um, participating in standardization, developing international standards, consensus-based standards. And um, today we will be talking about the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, the IEC, just have to go to the next slide, very good is uh, one of the world leading organizations recognized by the World Trade Organization. So this relates to the treaty technical barriers to trade, uh, where it is said that standardization is a part uh, of reducing uh, technical barriers to trade. We are a consensus-based uh, international standards organization, so we create consensus-based standards. We manage also conformity assessment. So this is different to ISO, for example, if uh, many of you know ISO, um, that we are also doing conformity assessment systems. So we are working in the creation of standards and we are also creating uh, systems in order to test standards. But today in this presentation, we will focus on standardization only. 
and uh, the IEC is covering all electric, electronic products, systems, and services collectively known as electrotechnology. We have a vision, and uh, this is part of our master plan. As, as an international organization, we have a master plan. And our vision is I see everywhere for a safer, more efficient world. And while this might first sound like a marketing claim, if we look into this, I see everywhere, it means that uh, an international standard only has a value if it's used everywhere, if it's accepted by all countries. So this is our highest goal, so that we create standards of value for everybody. And then for a safer and more efficient world. And this, uh, in one sentence, basically shows why we have international standards. So first of all, it's for safety. And safety is really important. If you just see uh, currency, if you see the, the power plugs, safety can be very different in the US and uh, in Europe. While in Europe, you have 230 volts, um, the risk for human beings is the risk of an electric shock. While in the US, you have 110, and there you have a risk of fire uh, through to overheating. So risks are different. And IEC is taking care that uh, risks are internationally taken care of. And then it's about efficiency, energy efficiency. You know that um, we are having more and more consumption of uh, electric power, so we have to look into efficiency. So IEC standards uh, are caring for more efficient use of electric energy, of resources, and uh, also of alternative energies. So the scope of the IEC is basically to strengthen the global trade in electrical, electronic devices. Innovation is very important, so we are supporting innovation through standards. Also the electrotechnical infrastructure development, smart urbanization, smart cities, smart grid, transportation, NXCSS, and efficiency. Energy access is very important for the sustainable development goals, because if you have access to energy, there's a direct relation to less poverty. So this is also very important and security of people and the environment. So everything electrical, electrotechnical, um, we're doing standardization here. Um, strategic objectives is the market and societal relevance to have a business model which is sustainable, to be a flexible organization and to have agile operations. Because especially electrotechnology, you have a lot of things which are rapidly changing new technologies, if it's just going from 4 to 5G, but also many other things. So we have to create standards which are uh, valid, but we also have to act agile, and we have to be very flexible to, to respond to the market needs, to the industry, to the consumers and others. We are a global knowledge platform, so you can call us like this. And currently we have 20,000 experts internationally who are uh, working in our committees. We have around 200 technical committees and subcommittees, around 10,000 international standards, and through conformity assessment, around 1 million certificates issued. And if you look at these 20,000 experts, these are just the experts sent by their countries to participate in creating international standards. Of course, in the countries, there are many, many more experts working on the national viewpoint, the consensus, um, and, and all the national comments on our standards. So it's, it's a huge effort. There's a huge community of experts who give their time and their interest in creating these standards. So this is the global reach. We have 173 countries. And somebody um, has seen, uh, in, I think in our communication department, somebody has seen that we cover with this over 99% of the world population and electric energy generation. So we have a pretty good reach for the time being, but of course we are continuously looking for more participation. And um, then uh, just looking into the countries, uh, looking for more participation, we have members. So the 173 countries, these are members who are participating at IEC and we have affiliates. These are developing countries, developing societies, we call them affiliates, we don't call them developing countries because some of the developing countries already became IEC member. And here you can see the new members from the last two years. So you can see that more and more countries also become an IEC member. 
and more and more and even very small countries uh, become an affiliate country with us. So we're continuously adding countries, supporting countries to join us, creating a national infrastructure, supporting them and uh, uh, helping them to develop in standardization and conformity assessment. I'm right now in Geneva here in Switzerland. Um, it's a rainy day. We have now three o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm happy for you to be in the morning. And uh, we also have other offices. We have one office, the regional center of North America in Boston. Well, it's, it's Worcester, close to Boston. But Boston sounds better, I guess. Uh, we have an office in Sao Paulo to support uh, the Latin American region. We have an office in Nairobi because uh, there's a lot of potential in Africa and uh, we want to support this. And we have an office in Singapore to support the Asian Pacific region. And we also have an office in Sydney while this is more focusing on conformity assessment for parts and for explosive atmospheres. So you see that we can be active in all time zones. We have technical officers and support available um, at all times to support our communities and, and uh, our committees. Also, we are working together with regions. So we are working in Europe with uh, CENELEC, uh, this European Standards Organization, AFSEC in Africa. A few in Asia, then we have FINCA, CrossQ, COPAND, and other organizations. So we are supporting and we are in regular contact with these regional corporations and organizations. And all of this um, is so important just to show you uh, some numbers. The world trade in electronics and electrical devices is 19.6 million, 19.6% uh, of the world trade. And if you compare it to primary energy or vehicles, you can see how large this field, how large the market is, and uh, therefore how high the interest is in participating in this market and how important standardization is in, in this area. We have different types of memberships, and I already mem uh, mentioned membership and affiliates. So we have the uh, full members, associate members, and affiliates, affiliates plus. I'm just clicking through this. Oops, and I was a bit too fast, so I'm going back. At least I try to. So it works almost fine with uh, sharing the screen, but um, I have to see how I can go back, probably with a just do this. Thank you, Karen. Great. OK, I was a bit too enthusiastic, I think, uh, with, with the slides. So thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next one. Very careful now. Yes, I was talking about the types of memberships. And this is a click through, so I better do this slow. So um, once we start with the affiliate, so usually in the membership process, we start with affiliate countries. And affiliates, uh, this is not a membership, so it's a free program to support uh, the establishment of standardization and conformity assessment in developing countries. For this, we have a specific program uh, and support and mentoring from uh, different countries and from us to make sure that uh, developing countries can fully participate in standardization. The next step would be an associate member. So this is a reduced form of membership where countries can participate, P member being, being an active participating member of four technical committees. They can already vote on the four technical committees. So we are supporting them to get more active and it's very important to have this step because uh, in the countries, of course, they have to establish their national infrastructure. They have to make sure that they have mirror committees. They have to make sure that they get experts on board uh, from all uh, interested parties, universities, consumers, industry, and others, regulators. And once they have this, once there's a good infrastructure, then they can become full member they can be a participant uh, or observer of all technical committees, may vote on all standards, and may submit comments on all standards and governance documents. And what is not written here is that also once you are a full member, you can also sell standards. You can, uh, yeah, you can uh, have national standards out of IC standards. So there are many options, but this is a careful way to make sure that these uh, processes are well established, they have a very good 
background uh, of experts when they give comments and um, and uh, others. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, full access to publication, that says it. Then um, I already mentioned that um, the backbone, so to say, of international standardization is laid down by the World Trade Organizations, the principles. Uh, in the link, you see the TBT agreement. This is the 2015 version. There might be a newer version right now, which mentions uh, standardization and conformity assessment as a, an essential part uh, for technical barriers to trade or against technical barriers to trade. And here we have the principles. So transparency, obviously, uh, standardization, international standardization is not a closed club, but it's very important that all interested uh, parties can participate. So openness, impartiality, and consensus. And consensus here is really the key word for creating standards. And if you see later when I explain the principles of how to uh, draft a standard, the consensus principle is the, the most important principle for us because consensus means, and usually when I, when I do a live presentations face to face, I always ask people what, what is consensus and sometimes people say it's, it's a full agreement, but it's not. Um, we define consensus as the absence of sustained opposition, which doesn't sound as positive as, as full agreement. So consensus really means that Obviously, when you do a meeting and uh, an international standards meeting, every party, every country comes with different ideas. Everybody uh, gets the message from home, please make sure that this will be part of the standard. But of course, sometimes we can't put everything into the standard, so we have to reach consensus. And the art of reaching a consensus really is very important to understand this, to practice this, to have the soft skills to reach this, because this means that you as a participant in the standardization process can be very efficient and can be very, yeah, can be very good. So learning this consensus principle is very important. It doesn't depend on how many people are participating in the meeting, if there's a good expert and uh, she can really give the good information uh, and, and can convince people, then this will be part of the standard. It is not uh, important how much people pay because for us, everybody pays something for participation but you don't pay in order to get your opinion. You really have to reach a consensus. This for the first stages of creating a standard. So this is really very important. And then of course, effectiveness. Uh, standards have to be effective and relevant. Um, we don't create standards so that we can have more money and we can sell more, but we create standards if they are effective and if there's relevance, if they're really needed by industry, by governance, by, by consumers or regulators. Coherence, so standards have to fit together. And you can see that the World Trade Organization equally uh, mentions that the concerns of developing countries have to be addressed. So this is why we have the affiliate country program. So this is really important to understand the background of international standardization, ICI, so ITU. Then we have the directives and the directives, um, these are our key documents for standards creation. And what you can see here is uh, you see the ISO and the IEC logo. So in fact, uh, we are sister organizations. Um, looking into the history, IEC has been created in 1906. And uh, I think the first general secretary of ISO has prepared an organization which later became, became ISO. So these organizations are very close. First IEC 1906, uh, that was a result of a World Fair in St. Louis in 1905, where um, all these electric machines were the big new thing, were the big new technology, but people saw that the developers created different currency, all the screws and mechanical parts were different. So people saw obviously that there's a need for standardization. And um, as a result of this 1906, uh, the country decided that uh, the IEC has, should be created. So we have been created since then. A short excursion to the history. I didn't cover this today because I wanted to focus more on the process. But you can see directives part one, same uh, ISO IEC, and uh, you can find them on our website for free download. 
This has the organizational structure, project management. Here you find the definition of consensus as the absence of sustained opposition, voting principles. In the later stage, we also do voting and some specific structures. Uh, IEC has some specific structures of systems committees, the whole systems committees area TC100. We have one participant for TC100 today, CISPR. Um, then we have uh, the directors part two. And directors part two basically explains how to draft a standard. So, excuse me. Um, here we have the requirements. We have normative and informative elements, the document structures explained, then the reference material listings and also the graphics and terminology rules for standardization. Um, there is some different terminology for standards. So in a standard, you would never see there must be something done, but you always see there shall be something done. So there's a specific language used for standards. And uh, at the IC Academy, we have, we have modules about drafting standards, and there we go more into the details. But this for the time being, ISO IC directors part one and part two together with the specifics for IEC. And then there's an ISO version with the specifics for ISO. This basically shows the structure of, uh, of our committees. So every technical committee has a secretary and a chair. And so these are the people leading the committee. And uh, a chair usually is a well-established expert. So this would be somebody who has been already an engineer in a committee, has been maybe working as a convener, has been an expert for many years. And a secretary would be somebody who is doing the administrative task of preparing the documents. And this traditionally or usually would be somebody coming from one of the standards organizations from the national standards organizations. And both of them should be a perfect team at IEC. And this is different from ISO. We encourage that both of the people come from a different country. So to show that there's real, uh, really a neutral uh, leadership of this committee. And then below this, we have uh, advisory groups, ad hoc groups, working groups, project teams, and maintenance teams. In the normal work where standards are created, this is happening in working groups. And uh, there will be a convener who basically has both functions of a secretary and chair. And this convener will be the person to establish the consents to make sure that standards are created in a high quality that a consensus is reached. And a consensus, again, is important because we want everybody to stay in the boat. If we would do a vote at a very early stage and some people would be unhappy and maybe leave the working group. So it's very important to keep everybody involved and to really find a solution. Project teams, uh, and below this, we can have um, subcommittees. And then in the subcommittees, we have the same structure. So. A technical committee usually would be, for example, household appliances, and a subcommittee would be microwaves or fridges or anything like this. So a subcommittee would have uh, some topic which is covered by the above, but more specific. We have different deliverables in uh, standardization at the IEC. And OK, this didn't really work, this slide. Let me go back. OK, yeah, so the graphic didn't really work, but it doesn't matter. So what I wanted to show here is uh, that, of course, we create international standards. Uh, these are this is our main business, but we also have technical specifications, public available specifications and technical reports. And while an international standard has the highest consensus, which means uh, the highest acceptance globally, it takes some time, of course, to create a standard because in order to get the consensus of all the countries, we need time. If we want to develop a document with a higher speed, there are also options. So if there's an industry and uh, you, for example, you're working in an industry, you have, um, you have a specification which you just would like to bring out globally to the market, you could send out a public available specification. So it would be a document with an IEC logo which would be marked as public available specifications. And like this, you have your specifications available globally, and then you can promote it 
And as a second stage, for example, then you, if you find enough countries to support the specification, you could go back to IEC and can make this a start of becoming an international standard. So there are different strategies of how you can bring your specification or a specification of your country or a national standard which you would like to promote towards being an international standard. And for this, um, one thing which I wanted to mention is that in all countries, we have national committees. So we as IEC central office, we don't operate in the countries, but in every country we have one national committee and the national committee of IEC in the country would be a focal point to discuss these things. So if you are in the industry, you have a specification which you would like to bring forward as an international standard, they could advise you, they could give tips and recommendations, they can share your experience how to do this, how to apply standardization as a strategy. And uh, in the US, it's ANSI, um, you know, ANSI, so ANSI has, within ANSI, we have the National Committee, the US National Committee, with uh, Tony Saitucci being our uh, National Committee Secretary and Kevin Lippert being our National Committee President. Okay, next slide. We have different stages in standards development, and I would like to quickly go through the stages and give you some examples. So um, there's an optional stage. Uh, the optional first stage is called preliminary work item stage. So if somebody has an idea or need for a standard, and when I say somebody, this could be a company, this could be even the committee working on other standards, because if you work on a specific standard, you might see that there's a need for, for another standard. Or this could be a national committee saying we have a national standard and we would like this to be an international standard. So there are different options. But if you feel uh, that you're not sure that there's a real need, maybe there's a need for the region. Maybe there's a need for a country for this standard. But if you want to find out if there's a real international need, you would add this to a technical committee as preliminary work item. And then there will be studies to find out if there's a real international need for the standard. So this is an optional stage. The usual first stage would be the new proposal stage. At the new proposal stage here, we would have um, a proposal for a standard and um, yeah, so there would be a proposal. So imagine you are in the US, you are working for an industry, you have um, a specification or something you would like to promote as an international standard. You would go to ANSI, you would discuss it with uh, Tony Sertucci, Kevin Lippert and the team, or with many others. The US NC has a lot of uh, very good experts and you discuss it. And once they agree, they would propose it to IEC. Um, as a standard, and then the proposal will be submitted also to other countries, to other participating members of the technical committee. They can comment and they can agree to say, yes, we would like also would like to participate. Of course, before you would do this, it makes sense to already speak to other countries. And maybe the national committee would recommend to already informally maybe speak with some other countries, say, hey, we have a good idea, would you like to support that? And then if you know that you have enough countries, you could do this and then um, you, this would be voted. And if you have a two third majority of participating members in the committee and also members who say we would like also to send experts to participate, then uh, this would be the team already, the, the working group who could work on this and since you propose this new work item proposal, you can also decide on the project leader in most of the cases. And then we have a plan. So we have uh, the need, we have a draft probably from, for the standard. We have uh, other countries supporting this and we have the experts sent by all the countries. So now it means we can start drafting the standard. So it goes to the next stage. And the next stage would be a working draft. So here that will be the first time that all the experts sent by the countries would meet and then discuss the standard. So here, uh, traditionally, if you um, have been selected being an expert, then uh, I'm, I'm talking about pre-COVID times now, you would travel to um, this meeting um, and, and 
basically we had meetings or we had meetings where the working group members were meeting face to face probably initially but also, of course we also do online meetings with the discussions but you would be in a group of international experts everybody has different opinions everybody has a job to do maybe some uh, feedback from the company and uh, to say if you go there please make sure that you can reach this and then you're sitting there and uh, then you have to act you have to be proactive um, you have to know how to reach a consensus for, so for this we have some recommendations we have a brochure explaining uh, what the best practice is here what you could do in order to be effective so of course um, oh yeah and very important if you're sent there as an expert you act as an expert so you're not a country delegate you're not the US delegate, but you act as an expert. So you are you are there to take decisions and not to say, oh, well, that's very interesting. I have to go back to my country in order to find an agreement. And then I come back because here uh, people will discuss real content. You are a real expert and you agree on things. You reach a consensus and you develop. Um, so for this, when, I, when we do the training sessions in the countries, we also practice this. We do role plays in how to be effective. And then that's, that's very interesting. Uh, here, you need soft skills. That's really, really important. Um, so the project teams work independently, working group project teams when necessary. And um, yes, uh, as, as somebody said here as a comment, I miss in-person meetings, but due to circumstances, happy with virt virtual meetings. Absolutely. Uh, of course, it's very effective. Um, I just wanted to speak a bit more about this uh, reaching a consensus. What I usually say when I when I talk about this, about how to reach a consensus, somebody sometimes there's a real fight in these meetings because people just stay on their opinion. They don't want to move. Maybe they have pressure from from their from their organizations at home, and then they don't want to move. And then the convener says, "Okay, let's have a coffee break." And then people go for the coffee break, they relax, they come back, and then suddenly they find a consensus. So, so coffee or tea is obviously very important for standardization. Um, this, of course, we can't do right now with the webinars or with the web meetings. This is going away a bit. So I, I hope uh, it, it works. We are very efficient uh, doing this online, but um, of course, face-to-face -face is also not so bad. But what we can see is now uh, there are more experts participating in these working group meetings and also the experts who are usually have to stay in the company because they are very important engineers and they cannot travel because they're very much needed. Now we have also these people in the working group. So we have more people in the working group. So also the virtual meetings sometimes are very beneficial. Um, yes, I, I could. You see, I could go on talking about this because it's very interesting because this is really how a standard starts to create. But uh, let's go to the next stage. So once the working group reaches a consensus, the convener uh, would give this document, would forward it to the TC secretary, and then the TC secretary will send it back to the countries. So all the countries will receive a CD document, the participating members and the observer members. So this CD document committee draft shows the consensus of uh, this small group of experts who drafted the standard. Now it's sent to all countries and all IEC countries can, all member countries can give their uh, comments on this. And this is super important because you might have uh, laws against what has been written in there in your country. So you might have national deviations. You might have completely different ideas about this and say, okay, but these experts said this, but actually we want it differently. So we encourage countries, if they receive it in their mirror committees, to comment as much as possible. There's no limit on the CD draft because once we do this, we are able to integrate all the concerns and, and all the comments from the countries, which results in a higher acceptance and in a much better uh, later standard. So. Here we have age 12 or 16 weeks initiated by the secretary agreed by the committee. And this is the stage where substantive technical comments are made by the mirror committee experts in the countries. And once this is done, uh, there will be a compilation of comments 
And then this CD document together with the compilation of comments will be given back to the working group. And then the IEC working group will uh, change the CD accordingly with all the comments received. This is a lot of work. And if there are too many comments, we can repeat this phase because we want to make sure that all the comments uh, by the countries are respected, are taken into account. And uh, we afterwards have a document which includes all the comments as much as we can. Um, once we have this and uh, the committee thinks, the working group thinks that the comments are taken care of, that will be the next stage. And this stage is called committee draft vote. But now you see before this, there was a pure consensus based drafting of the standards. Now we go to the next stage, now it's vote. Uh, so this is a CDV, committee draft vote. In uh, ISO, it's called DIS. It's the same stage like this. And in this inquiry stage, committee draft vote, the draft is submitted to national committees for eight weeks translation period. You might say, why is that? Well, um, we want to give to all countries, also to the countries who don't speak English, to be able to translate this prior to uh, the voting process so that the national experts all have the same time to read the document, to understand the document, to find the national viewpoint, national consensus, and then come back to us. So for Germany, for China, for all the countries who don't have English as native language, this is a very important stage. And once the translation period is over, there will be a 12 weeks voting period where countries can discuss and can decide on uh, how their viewpoint is. And if everything worked, went well, and you mentioned at the CD, all comments have been made by the countries, uh, and then all the comments from CD has been, have been put in the document. Ideally, what we have here would be a 100 agreement by the countries, 100% agreement, because all the comments should be already in the document. And if we have no comments, no more, no further comments and a 100% agreement by the participating countries, by the members, we could go directly to publication. This is why the CD process is really important. It's really important to give uh, comments from the countries. If not, and this of course often, also often happens, and there are still some technical comments, there's not a 100% agreement, then it goes uh, to the next, uh, it goes back to the countries as an FDIS, Final Draft International Standard. And this document, we already start uh, the editing process, we already start the preparation for, for the international standard. Um, then this document is uh, circulated for a six weeks period. And this document, there are no technical comments allowed for the national committees who vote yes because we don't want to hear, yes, but could you please change a little bit? Because if everybody says that, we have to go in another and another and another phase. So here, no technical comments are allowed from NCs who vote yes. NCs who now, after all these processes, vote no, must give a technical reason why at this point they still disagree with this uh, draft standard. Um, and we did a consensus here because countries said, yes, but if we have comments and we basically agree on the document, so now there's a side rule that countries, okay, they can give comments, but the comments would not be taken into account for this standard, uh, for, for this draft, but for the maintenance, which will happen in a few years. It's a bit complicated, but I just wanted to mention this. So basically, uh, final draft international standards, you can say, yes, you should not give comments, you can say no, you must give a technical reason. And um, then uh, once this final draft international standard is voted by a two third majority approved, then we go to publication. So then this document will be published as an international standard. So the uh, allowed time to publish it is within one and a half months and our average in our editing department is one month. So what happens here is that uh, the standard is created. Uh, the standard will be made available on our library server. And uh, now all the countries who are a member of IEC can take this standard as a word form and can start a national adoption process of the standard. So they can decide 
that this standard also becomes a national standard in the country. But now, if the country gave all the feedback at the CD phase, basically they just have to put another cover page and this would be a national standard. If they have been inactive and they suddenly see, oh my God, we have a lot of national deviations, we can't use the standard like that, they have to rework parts of the standard, they have to put uh, another page saying these are the national deviations, they have to do a lot of work in order to use this as a national standards. So uh, there's a huge advantage in being very active at the very early stage of the standardization process. Now, just repeating quickly the steps I just mentioned, I hope this works here online. Yes, so we have the preliminary stage, the proposal stage, preparatory committee inquiry, approval and publication. And here you see a decision by the technical committee is to say, okay, this preliminary work item is fit to become, so we would go to the next stage. Then here is a decision by the technical committee to, to repeat the CD if there are too many comments and also to say, okay, now the CD is ready, now we go to the next stage. And as P members, participating members, as countries' actions, uh, the actions you do in the country, go back again. Oops, it was moving from alone, okay. So if we go back again, um, this is what you do as a country, as a participating member in the US, you would say, okay, we agree on this draft and we send resources, we send experts. So this would be an action then of course to comment at the CD phase, to comment and vote and to vote on the final draft of national standards. So you can see here, this is the stage, the action. This is done by the IEC technical committee or subcommittee. And this is done by the country, by the P members from the countries. Um, here you see uh, some graphs. And uh, you can see that this is our output, uh, was our output in 2019. So you can see um, in 2019, we did 477 standards, technical reports, 53, technical specifications, 39, and we didn't do public available specifications. So this is not so many are using this, but it's, it's a good recommendation if you want to promote a specification from your country. Average development time is still 32 and a half months, but it's very difficult to speak about average development time because we have a standard about copper, the material, which have been created, I think, in 1916 and never been changed since then, but uh, we are still updating the standard. And then we have standards where, which are about 5G or very new technologies. And really the speed of how a standard is created depends on the interest of the industry of the regulators. Because if there's a technology where a standard is urgently needed, of course, a lot of experts would uh, heavily work on this while at other standards, like, like uh, I don't have an example right now, uh, it would take more time because there's no urgency. So average is a difficult to speak about this, but still average 32 and a half months. Um, to talk a little bit about the maintenance, we have a maintenance of standards, of course, an IEC standard is not valid forever, and um, we decide at the CDV stage about a stability period, which means that the committee says this standard is planned to be valid for the next five years, six years, seven years. So. Um, it's between three and 12 years as a decision by the committee and the stability date defines the end of the stability period. So if you see uh, if, uh, in one year we have the end of the stability date, then the secretary would start a maintenance review process to see do we have to change uh, something in the standard, do we have enough experts to change it, or is the standard used at all, or we can, can we withdraw the standard. So there's a process taking place. I know it's different at ISO, at ISO there's a systematic review of five years, while at IEC it depends on the technology. We don't have to review copper as a material every five years. So here, of course, the stability period would be longer, but then for modern technology, for networks, for uh, alternative energies, this would be a shorter period because there's a lot of development in the market. Then meetings, this is also very important. Uh, we have different types of meetings. We have the technical committee, subcommittee, plenary meetings. 
And in these plenary meetings, usually decisions are taken like uh, the new conveners elected or there are reports from the working groups to decide uh, if, if something has to move faster. Uh, many decisions are taken. And in the plenary meetings, you have participants who are representatives from the countries. So you have delegations from different countries. You have a head of delegation and, and others. And uh, they would vote on decisions taken in a plenary meeting about the work of the technical committee or subcommittee. And here at IEC, every country has one vote. So China and Chile, they both have one vote. Every country, one vote. And um, then you have working group meetings and working group meetings are different. In working group meetings, the experts are nominated by the national committee, but they represent themselves. So if you have somebody from UL participating in an IEC meeting, she would represent herself as being an expert. The same for Corning, the same for Siemens, the same for any organization. Uh, this is important because we are discussing content in the meetings and we have to agree on something. And if you are delegate by your country, but not a real expert, you cannot reach a consensus in the meeting. So first of all, working group experts are representing themselves as an expert. They can take decisions. Of course, they might get some homework from their companies, from the national committees, but they are nominated by the NC and represent themselves. So this basically is um, the end of my short overview. Um, I could go on for hours, that's for sure. And uh, I, we do a lot of presentations like this. We do a lot of uh, training at the IEC Academy. What I would like to share with you is uh, this link, IEC Academy, because we are doing at least once a month a webinar on topics like this, but also other interesting topics. We train the TCSC secretaries at IEC. We also train the national committee secretaries. Whenever we have a new member, we train them. And we are also doing workshops for countries. So if a national committee like the US is asking us to do training specifically for the US, we are also doing this. We're very flexible in organizing trains. We are very happy to get request and to organize something for you. What we do right now is we're developing a an online module, online training where conveners and project leaders can time independently uh, work on modules, train themselves, do an exam, and then print out a PDF uh, that they participated in this training. So this is something we are almost ready to announce. And I think in the next two months, we will have this ready so that IEC conveners and project leaders can have a proper course on their own time. OK, that was my quick presentation. I hope it was more or less interesting and uh, I would be happy to take your questions. Jen Hendrick, so wonderful of a presentation. Thank you so much for, for speaking with us today. I, I, I think we all can see why you are the head of the IEC Academy. <laughs> and, and certainly I wanted to bring out that last slide because that was certainly one of my questions is, um, the, the standardization process has a lot of steps and as a technical expert, you might be nominated by your national committee to participate and getting up to speed can be difficult. And maybe you can speak a little bit further for those that, that haven't participated before and might get nominated by their national committee. You know, what, tell us a little bit more about those modules and those trainings that you offer to help get those individuals up and running. Yes. Um, so I mentioned a brochure before. We have a brochure uh, which is called Secrets of Effective Participation. And we created this brochure by asking seasoned experts and chairs if you would right now have to start uh, as a new expert in, a, in, a, in one of these working groups, what would be the uh, essential information you would like to give yourself? And uh, we drafted this brochure, we created this brochure, and basically it uh, gives something which is not rocket science it's, it's very normal so first of all be on time um, feel free to speak and uh, a lot of other things uh, build networks within the meeting um, 
be proactive. So if you say, I can do that, or if uh, the meeting starts and somebody says, okay, how should we start? That you say, hey, I would have an idea. Why don't we use this text I prepared um, as the, the basis for what we do right now? Because like this, you can guide the whole development of the standard in one direction. Of course, there will be comments given and, and uh, there will be changes, but at least you will be the person to create the framework. Um, one tip we also give is don't don't be shy. There might be, and, and this happens happened to me, that you have these old guys in the meeting and that you're the new person, and uh, then they try to talk you over, and they said, oh, no, 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 you said, no, no, wait, 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 no, no, let me let me say that. It's it's. I think I would like to really uh, mention this with a smile. So don't let don't let don't be overrun, for example. So there are different tips like this, but uh, I don't want to. Give them all right now. One thing uh, I'm doing since 2017 is in China, as an example, um, I'm doing a young leaders training. And um, you might know that we are having a young professional program, which uh, is also, and there are different national versions of this young professional program where uh, young people are trained uh, to become a leader in IEC committees. And um, I supported the US, I was in the US last year to, uh, to support uh, the recreation of the US YP program. Uh, but in China, we are really doing it uh, to the maximum. So what we do there is I developed a role play where people can practice consensus, but I also see them when they do presentations and I, I encourage them. And, and uh, there's a very interesting learning curve in, in China. That's why I mentioned this uh, last year, I was just within the meeting and somebody suddenly somebody said, oh, we don't have enough men. I was like, wow, that's the first in standardization. I'd never heard that before. Um, what I could see is that um, there were 66 people the first day and um, they had to introduce themselves. They had to talk, they, they had to be proactive. And uh, by the second day, we had to filter out uh, 30, uh, 50%. There were no men left. And I was thinking to myself, how, how does this happen? And I saw that uh, because in these role plays and in, in these interactions, uh, soft skills are so important that um, we were in a situation where really um, we could see who in China has, has much better soft skills and has much better uh, diplomacy and then communicating. And this is so important in these meetings. And I would really like to encourage people practicing this because basically, of course, you have to be an expert, but if you're just an expert and you're just saying this is my expertise, you wouldn't you would go nowhere. So this is really important to practice this and to be aware that uh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would be very happy to do more also in other countries. I've been doing it in uh, Germany and then uh, in China and in the US to participate in these meetings and to support uh, building up young leaders. Excellent. Thank you for that. It sounds like you you answered quite a few of the questions in the chat related to, you know, women in standards, we work very hard to educate and to bring visibility to standards to so many different groups of individuals, including consumers, different industry, um, the general public researchers, and often they say in the meetings, you know, when they do get invited and they are able to participate, they might be the only one in the room representing that segment. And so it's difficult to convey their opinions and have them heard because um, perhaps the rest of the group is, is looking at it from a different perspective. So I think your notes about using those soft skills that, that we've developed over time to make connections with the others in the room is so important to, so that they can see it from our perspective and they can see those opinions and give them thought. Um, and, and maybe as, as a final question, uh, we did have, have one talking about transparency and, and certainly from the international perspective, the national committees kind of run that. And so it can be difficult for others to see, you know, what are, are the, the technical committees working on? What, what status are they in? How can we get involved? Maybe you can speak to that a little bit about what is the transparency for, for us looking at those technical committees to see what are the projects and, and opportunities? Yes, thank you. So, um... For, for this, basically, I should do a screen sharing and then go to our website, because if you go to the IC website, you go to click on technical committees, you can uh, go to any technical committee and you can see 
everything is open, everything is transparent. You can see who are the project leaders. You can see where, at which stage is the project, what kind of projects are ongoing right now. So everything is visible on the IEC website. Um, this is a huge effort in transparency. You can't download standards. No, you can't do this, but you can do anything else. You can see what countries are involved. Is this important for us? What kind of uh, drafts are, are done right now? Um, but of course, if you are in the country, you might not say, hey, today I would like to go to the IEC website. I'm, uh, I have no illusion. So this might not happen quite a lot. Um, here I see very much the, uh, the uh, here would look at the national committees. It's very important for the national committees also to promote the availability and the transparency of standards. Um, that it's really open for everybody to participate uh, from the countries. And if you can't be sent to the international meetings that at least you are able to participate as a national expert and give your input. We also have a public commenting platform on the IC website. So here you can log in. You don't have to be a member of anything. You just go to public commenting on the IC website. You can create an account yourself. It doesn't cost anything. And then you can see all the current CDVs. You can't download them uh, because we didn't want to have the risk that people download a CDV in development and then say, this is a standard build a technology on that. And then there might be accidents happening or, or whatever. But you, all our CDVs through this platform are completely open. You can go there, you can create your login and you can uh, have a look at all the current CDVs. You can search for topics which are interesting for you. You can even comment on this and then your comments get forwarded to the US and Z if you log in as US. And then it's up to them to contact you and say, hey, thank you for this comment. Would you like to participate? So I encourage you to have a look at this public commenting platform and uh, just to have a look at the CDVs because they are transparent in there. They're open, you can have a look at them. Perfect. Yes. And uh, I don't know if everyone on the call knows this, but Women in Standards does track the IEC commenting platform. And we include that in our weekly uh, tweets out to the membership with lists of what com uh, documents are out for comment. So if you haven't visited the standards out for public comic webpage, please take a look. You'll see all the IEC documents that are currently open for comment and their due dates. So you know when to uh, take a look and there is a link to the IEC website there as well so you can easily find how to sign up for those e-newsletters. E I get them every week. They come like clockwork and it's easy to click on the link and go to the page. Um, so definitely check that out. So at this point we've got a minute to go and I would like to offer a thanks to Jan Henrik for the amazing presentation. We'd love to have you back and certainly would, would love to get that tutorial on how to find the technical committees and, and see what projects they're working on. So perhaps we'll coordinate that as well. And I wanted to do a quick shout out for IEC who is a signatory to the UN Declaration on Gender Inclusive Standards. Uh, we're so excited to have your participation and efforts to bring more individuals into the standards development process and to consider how to make standards inclusive of all genders. So a big thank you for that. And certainly we look forward to future presentations. Everyone take a look at the IEC website and their training programs. I've been to a few of the modules. They're very interesting, so check them out. And I will give back the rest of your day, but check out the Women in Standards website, consider joining as a member and certainly visit IEC. The recording will be uh, posted to the Women in Standards website in a few days, and I'll make sure to send out an e email to all of our registered attendees so that you know where to go to find